good morning and welcome to another episode of Conversations with Eddie Lines. Pastor, how are you this morning? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing well. Hey, today's subject for our podcast is having a vision for your family. And that's something that I've heard you say before. And I think at at our church, we're blessed with a lot of young families, a lot of people uh, that are having kids and raising kids and, and me and my wife are in that stage right now. And you've used the term before, you need to have a vision for your family. So one, where does that come from? And two, what is, what does that mean? How do you start that endeavor? Well, you know, I I guess what I notice is when I talk to couples and often couples come to me when they're, they're in the big middle of a crisis or conflict. And I've, I've had many couples fight. I mean, it's, it's brutal in front of me. And I begin to think about why is, why do we have to get to this? How do we solve this? Because I find myself feeling like I'm just going round and round and round and round, and nobody's ever to hear me. So I thought I thought about this. Actually, what needs to happen in every family is we need to have a vision for our family. Hmm. We need to have a vision for our marriage. We need to have a vision for the culture that we are going to develop so it's intentionally developed. This is how, when I walk into my family, I would like to see people behaving toward one another. This is the tone. This is the feeling I want to have in the room. And so I think that having a vision for the family is such an important thing because that will guide you through all of the you know, the incidental things that you have to deal with on a regular basis. So you need to have a, an idea of the, the the tone, the way that you communicate, the way that you treat each other, maybe some expectations of conduct. And yes. So tell, me, tell me about that and maybe where that comes from. You know, I remember when my wife and I got married and we would observe other couples, um, close friends, mm-hmm. and they would just like fight with each other, even in front of us. And they would talk about throwing things, and and I remember Cindy and I talking, and, and she says, I don't ever want that to be us. I says, I don't either. Yeah. I, I want us to solve everything. Like the, the scripture says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Yeah. But let's, let's solve it, and let's never let it get to the point where we're behaving in that fashion toward each other. So we made a decision. We're just not going to ever yell at each other. Hmm. We're just not going to fight like that. And that was sort of like the beginning of this for me, this idea of having a vision. And of course, I've read lots of books about this as well. But um, I, you know, I walk into a family sometimes, and I, I hear the way the children speak to the parents, and it lacks respect. There's not a sense of obedience. And, you know, that's a real uncomfortable environment to be in. Yeah. Because the people that are visiting, they feel very uncomfortable. Why? Because that's just not the right way to live. And so I think having a vision for your family and the family's culture is key. So what are some aspects to having a, a vision for your family or a vision for your marriage because i think for some people maybe you didn't grow up in it and you you know you came from a broken home or a mm-hmm. family that uh, they weren't believers they didn't know jesus so you see some things that your parents did and you don't want to to replicate that in your in your parenting or in your marriage um, what do you do how do you start to kind of create that culture in in your family unit okay so if you were to pick up the bible right and let it describe to you what the ideal family looked like, you know, I would identify three primary values that should shape the culture and behavior in the tone of your family. Yeah. Okay, so here's my three. The first one is honor and respect. Honor and respect. You know, honor one another. Respect one another. I mean, that's very biblical. Um, for instance, the reason why... I think it's important for parents to teach children how to have manners is that the very baseline of why there are manners is it's a way to express honor and respect to the people around you. So when I teach my kids to say please and thank you, I'm not trying to make them stiff and formal at the table. I want to instill within them this genuine sense of respecting and honoring the people around them. When you don't say please, 
and you sound demanding, that's not honoring and that's not respectful. Um, I've heard people say, well, you know, it's, it's just the family. We don't have to be so formal here. So you're going to treat the people outside of the home better than you treat the most important people in your life? That doesn't make sense to me at all. Sure. We should be most respectful, polite, and honoring to the people in our home because they matter the most. Yeah. I remember one time Cindy and I, we were guests in one of her um, uncle's and aunt's house. It was actually at the funeral of her stepfather. And so we stayed with the older brother and his wife. And we observed how so beautifully this old couple treated each other. Mm. They greeted each other in the morning like they really cared about each other, you know? It wasn't grunts and groans. It was like, good morning. How are you, honey? I'm fine. How are you? I mean, I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, wow, they act like they hadn't seen each other all night. And they had. Yeah. But it was so beautiful. There was always the please and the thank you. And so, you know, we, that reinforced to us that that's one of the visions we have for our family, that respect and honor should be a part of the interactions all the time. And it wasn't for outsiders. It was for us. Yeah. Because, I mean, I have, I'm in the throes of this. I have a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and a six-month-old. So we're trying to keep civility. I mean, we're trying to yes. keep, um, manners are like, if we can get there, it's a good day. But what we're learning is that it's not just for uh, mom and dad. That those, those bleed out to other places. They, they kind of seep out into the other areas of their lives that if they can learn to, to honor and respect mom and dad, yeah. they can learn to honor and respect the people around them that we can't control how they are when they're with other people. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's a value that starts to be instilled in them at home that they start to see other places. So... Yeah, that, that makes some sense I mean, to I, me. I think the most important way to develop that sense of honor and respect in your children is that the very baseline of how they interact is with the please and thank you and yes sir and yes ma'am. And, and I know people think that that seems a little formal. It's not formal. It is, this is how I live. This is who I am. This is the way we act with each other. And if that's the way you are, when you go out, that's the way you are. Yeah. If it's a put on because there's visitors in the house, then it gets put on and taken off. Sure. And it's not going to work. It's not who you really are. No. It's not what you're instilling. Yeah. And I'm, again, in the throes of that, and what I'm learning is that uh, we don't naturally run towards some of these things. Like my four-year-old and two-year-old have their own agenda, and it's whatever comes at most fun, whatever yes. comes at their emotion. And honor is not something that they see as a value at four and two years old. So right. it's, it's, there's some meaning to it. So. But when they go apply for a job at 16, they're going to notice. If, yeah. Well, who are you? How do you behave? What is what is what is the 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 you know the muscle memory in athletes? Uh, what yeah. is the default position of the way you treat the people around you? That's going to show then. Because everybody's known somebody that has all the talent in the world, but doesn't respect the people that are put above them, and it's everybody else's fault. Yeah. And it's somebody else's problem. And well, I didn't do. It was my fault. Well, mm -hmm. if we honor and respect the people around us. That changes the conversation. So what, what else is on the list? You said you had three things. The first is, is honor and respect in the household. What's the second? Okay, the second thing is integrity. Integrity means I'm going to mean what I say and say what I mean and do what I promise. And when I don't do it, integrity leads me to have to admit, I'm sorry. I told you I would do that. I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. I acknowledge that's wrong. And you don't have to go through all of these fancy statements, but the attitude of, I'm sorry, I messed up. And I have to do that to my wife. I have to do that to my kids. Um, it's part of life because you will mess up. Integrity says, I'm not going to explain it away. I'm not going to act like you're exaggerating this. I'm going to say, yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. I think integrity is so important. You don't build relationships without trust, and you can't have trust without integrity. That's just like a basic relational fact. Nobody gets a pass on that. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the hard things that, as, as I talk to college students and young adults, they have a parent, they have a family member who was trustworthy most of the time, but that 5% of the time, they really got burned. And it's hard to trust because of 5% yeah. of the time. Yeah. And... Uh, 
for the times that you've gone back and said, hey, I messed up. I'm sorry. And you didn't put a qualifier of, hey, I messed up because you. Yes. That's such a different thing. Yes. So anything else on integrity? Integrity is um, the second piece. You know, I think that's the important thing. Yeah, integrity. It's a simple one. It's it not, is you don't have simple. we don't have to drive it into the ground. No, you don't. It's tell it's the truth. Easy. Yeah. Right. So, what's the third thing? The third thing was I think you need to build the culture of um, service and love. Hmm. Service and love. You know, kindness. Kindness is a powerful thing that will melt the heart of somebody. Yeah. So, like when mom's struggling to get all the groceries in the house, if there is a culture of service integrity. I'm sorry, service and love. Um, And it has to be prompted at first because you're building a culture. It doesn't exist until you build it. And then you have to keep tweaking it and keep reminding yourself of the vision. So you tell your son or your daughter, hey, go help your mom bring the groceries in. You shouldn't make her have to do that. And when mom feels like all of a sudden it's not, She's all alone trying to get everything done and everybody's doing their own thing and ignoring her. When all of a sudden she feels like, oh, wow, um, I didn't even ask and my kids are out here helping me unload the groceries from the car. Now, that sounds like a very mundane thing. That is a huge thing. When we serve each other, um, when someone says, man, I, I need this, and there's a person in the house that stands up and says, I'll get it for you. Now, honestly, I have to work on this. I've even declared this to my kids. You know, this year, I'm trying to be a better servant. So um, when the request is, go turn off the TV, I will do that, you know, when I'm on my game. I don't always do it. But, you know, if you're the father and you lead the way, hey, I need someone to go do this, I'll, I'll do it for you. If you start doing that, they start picking it up, you're actually building the culture and modeling the kind of behavior that you want. So... Um, and then I think to appreciate it, mm-hmm. you know, to say, man, thank you for helping your mom. You know, th- thank you for, for doing that or doing this. I, you know, you, you came out and helped me. You were busy, but you did it anyway. Yeah. And so to, to appreciate the, that um, act of service, I think, is pretty powerful. And honestly, w- what is a better dif- definition of love than to serve? Yeah. Jesus came as a servant. He washed his disciples' feet. Service and love go hand in hand. So in a household, can you just imagine you walk into the house and everybody is there, and it's not perfect, but they are respectful to each other. And they honor each other. And, you know, they made a mistake, but they own it. And they admit it was wrong, and they go fix it. Or there's an environment where people are actually stepping up to help each other when they don't have to. That's the second mile, as we read in the New Testament. Mm-hmm. I don't have to do this, but I'm going to do it for you. Yeah, that's beautiful. We often don't get to that powerful moment because we're just all about the minimum requirements. Yeah, I did my part of it. Yes. Now you do yours. When when Tyler and I first got married, we we made these lists, and it was like these are all the the indoor chores, and these are all the outdoor chores. And we said, well, obviously, I'll do all the outdoor chores, and you do all the indoor chores. And it took about a week for me to realize I need to be doing both. I can't just go, hey, that's your chore, and this is my chore, so let me know when you get your chores done, and I'll get my... I realized that my role as as the husband, and you know, you, you brought up that the way that Christ serves the church, I had to do both. I couldn't look at the list and say, I mean, it's on your side of the paper, so... Yeah, get it done. Hard for you. Hard for you. I I, <laughs> I had to look at it and say these are both my lists. Yeah, and and that was a way that now I'm not perfect in it by by no means, but it's a way that I can serve and love my my wife and my family. So honor and respect, integrity, service and love. Those are kind of the three components that you see. And you what you were just kind of explaining was I don't know whether it's your 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 job or your house or your kids or even you know if you're if you have a roommate. Yes. Who doesn't want to be in that scenario? You don't have to have a right. family to make these part of the culture that you bring yes, to a so scenario, good, yeah. to a workplace. Because right. I can listen to something like this, maybe me 10 years ago, and say, I'm not married, I'm, not, I'm excluded from this conversation. But you can bring this culture with you wherever you go. And having a vision for what you want to bring forward, not because you're this great person, but because you represent Christ. Uh-huh. And these were things that, that, that Christ did. Pastor, any, any more ideas on having a vision for your family? You know, once again, I think the most important thing is, and 
I think that many people don't do this. Sit down with your spouse or sit down by yourself as mm. you as you described. Talk about the cultural values you want to develop in yourself and with your spouse and in your family and serve the vision. Don't solve the problems. Mm. I think that's the most important thing there. Serve the vision. You know, the higher you go in in understanding what you're trying to accomplish, the more power you have to solve the problems. If all you do is try to solve problems, then you're going to get worn out. You end up fighting unnecessarily, and you never get anywhere because you don't know where you're going. The vision is the destination. Hmm. That's so good. Well, Pastor, thank you. Uh, It's been another good episode, and we hope you uh, join us next time. Thank you.